hi there and welcome back to 19th and 20th century philosophy i'm matt brown and today we're talking about william james anna julia cooper and american pragmatism so um what i want to do today is uh talk to you a little bit about uh, these two figures i give you an introduction but also start to talk to you about the philosophical tradition known as american pragmatism American pragmatism is the is the first philosophical tradition that originated in the United States that wasn't um, super dependent on ideas coming out of, of Europe. Um, the pragmatist tradition, like any philosophical tradition, is somewhat difficult to characterize. Um, it it concerns in some ways the connection of knowledge and and agency. Um, it, it concerns the analysis of philosophical problems through the lens of, um, of practice and of experience. Um, uh, so that word, that word prag pragmatist or pragmatic um, is meant to tie into um, uh, sort of agency and practice. It's a post-Darwinian philosophy. It attempts to grapple with um, the philosophical meaning of, um, of Darwinism in biology and, and the Darwinian conception of the human being. Um, and, and pragmatism is now uh, you know, no longer just an American phenomenon and it's, it's seen as a major alternative in the philosophical uh, world to both the analytic and the continental philosophy traditions. Though in some sense it's both influential on and um, older than both of those traditions. Now, um, many figures that we think of as pragmatist, um, but some of the early figures were part of uh, what we what was called the metaphysical club. Um, and the metaphysical club is, a, is was the name of a discussion group um, about philosophy in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, in the early 1870s that included among its members um, Charles Sanders Peirce, um, who's often credited as, as the originator of some of the main ideas of pragmatism, um, William, William James, who we'll talk about today, um, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., who would eventually go on to become the uh, Supreme Court Justice, um, and a number of other figures, including um, uh, the, the lawyer Nicholas St. John Green um, and uh, Chauncey Wright. Um, uh, who was a kind of uh, scientist and, and philosophical thinker as well. Um, now, the Metaphysical Club um, uh, was most active during the year of 1872, um, but it was active on and off throughout the early 1870s, the, 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 the pragmatist version of the Metaphysical Club. Um, one of the early ideas... Um, uh, that uh, was very popular in this metaphysical club um, was due to the psychologist and philosopher Alexander Bain, and it was a particular notion about the nature of belief. And um, Charles Peirce uh, later credited Nicholas St. John Green for um, for bringing this uh, uh, to his attend to, to the club's attention. Um, Bain really emphasized the importance of a direct connection between belief and action. Um, as Peirce described it, um, although this is not exactly the way Bain himself described it, belief um, is what one believes is a matter of what one is willing or prepared to act on. Um, so, uh, you know, Bain was a Scottish thinker, um, uh, 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 a Scottish philosopher and psychologist. Uh, of course, although you know we say pragmatism is the first uh, truly or uniquely or um, we say that pragmatism is the first philosophical tradition of American origin, um, the members of the Metaphysical Club uh, entertained a variety of, of uh, ideas from European thought. Uh, they were interested in Bain, um, uh, there was some interest in the British empiricists and utilitarians. There was interest uh, in the work of um, Kant and the German idealists. Uh, William James was particularly interested in the French philosopher Charles Renouvier. Um, so, of course, the, you know, it didn't happen in a vacuum. Um, the New England transcendentalists uh, were also an influence. Um, 
So one of the one of the views that many think of as sort of characteristic of pragmatism is a kind of um, methodological view about the analysis of philosophical problems or um, of concepts. And um, one way to describe this is captured in what Charles Peirce called the pragmatic maxim. Um, so Peirce says, consider what effects which might conceivably have practical bearings we conceive the object of our conception to have. Then our conception of those effects is the whole of our conception of the object. So for Peirce, this is a way of analyzing concepts, of analyzing ideas, and making them clear, um, and was particularly applied by the members of the group to philosophical problems or philosophical concepts, not exclusively, but, but primarily. Um, another thing that the pragmatists are well known for are various pragmatist theories of truth. Um, uh, now I say theories here advisedly. Sometimes you hear talk of the, pra the pragmatist theory of truth, but different pragmatists have thought about truth in, in slightly or, or more significantly different ways. Here are two interesting statements about truth. Peirce says, the opinion which is fated to be in, uh, ultimately agreed to by all who investigate is what we mean by the truth. And the object represented in this opinion is the real. So this is a kind of uh, 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 sort of analysis of um, the meaning of truth and real um, uh, by Peirce. Here's William James in a somewhat different vein. He's, James says, the true is the name of whatever proves itself to be good in the way of belief and good too for definite assignable reasons. I hope it's clear to you that these are actually fairly different ideas. Um, one concerns um, one concerns sort of the uh, inquirers and what and what they will agree to in a kind of long run possible scenario. The other is more maybe uh, less or, or less tied to to the sort of the end of inquiry and more immediate perhaps. Okay, so so those are some. Um, those are some distinctive ideas from the American pragmatist, the American pragmatist tradition. You may have heard of them uh, uh, before in some other context. Um, but now I want to I want to back up and uh, uh, focus on our two um, on our two philosophers, James and uh, Cooper, and talk a little bit about their background and uh, their their uh, philosophical thought. So um, starting with William James. Um, so William James's father, Henry James Sr., uh, was an independently wealthy uh, theologian um, uh, and a, a kind of member of the intellectual elite of the, the, the Northeast, East Coast. Um, his brother, Henry Jr., was, of course, the famous novelist you probably have encountered in, in English class. You know, it's funny, it's sometimes said um, of the brothers, William and Henry James, uh, one of them was a great psychologist and the other was a, was a, uh, a great writer. Um, but unfortunately, they both picked the wrong career. Um, or another version of that joke is um, William James was a psychologist who wrote like a novelist and Henry James was a novelist who wrote like a psychologist. Um, their sister Alice, by the way, was also a, a brilliant writer, though as her diaries were not published until after her death, this was only kind of known um, uh, widely uh, posthumously. Um, now, William James studied uh, in both America and in various places in Europe. He received uh, an MD degree, but he never practiced medicine. He was originally appointed at Harvard to teach physiology human physiology, comparative physiology. Um, and then he was later, uh, he started teaching psychology. He was appointed as an assistant professor of philosophy, primarily to teach psych, uh, psychology, and then later began teaching more widely in philosophy, various areas of philosophy. In 1890, after he'd been doing psychology for a long time, uh, he published a two volume work, The Principles of Psychology, um, uh, then and for many years, the most important uh, textbook in the field, the most important early textbook in psychology in English, for sure. Um, the, the essay we read today was published a few years later. The Will to Believe was published in 1896. 
1898, he published a lecture uh, on uh, called Philosophical Conceptions and Practical Results, where um, he, he was the first person to use the term pragmatism in print uh, to refer to, to that particular philosophy. He credited Charles Peirce there, of course. Um, in 1902, he published the lectures on the varieties of religious experience, kind of the first attempt at a, at a real um, psychology, sociology, and philosophy of religion combined, or empirical study of religion. And then in 1907, uh, quite late in his career, he published uh, the book Pragmatism, A New Name for Some Old Ways of Thinking, kind of definitive statement of his pragmatist philosophy. Now, Anna Julia Cooper uh, was not a member of the intellectual elite, nor was she a member of the in inner circles of pragmatism. And yet, in many ways, her philosophy fits with that tradition. Um, in some ways, in fact, I think she outdid William James, uh, being more consistently pragmatist than he was. Now, Cooper's work has also been uh, classified as a contribution to feminist philosophy, to standpoint theory, to critical philosophy of race, and to African-American philosophy. Um, her, her thought is, I think, uh, deep and interesting um, and uh, has well been well worth the recovery uh, work that's gone into it in recent years. Um, Cooper was born into slavery in 1858, um, uh, and she received her PhD in history from the Sorbonne in Paris, France in 1924. Um, much of her life she worked as an educator as well as an activist. Um, she was a leading thinker uh, on black liberation as well. She engaged um, directly or indirectly with uh, uh, figures like Frederick, Frederick Douglass, Debbie E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, Sojourner Truth, and Ida B. Wells. Um, uh, her first and, and best known book uh, is the 1892 uh, A Voice from the South by a Black Woman of the South, um, which the essay uh, that we're reading for today, uh, uh, The Gain from a Belief, is, uh, is included. It's included in that volume. Um, so that's Cooper. Let's talk a little bit about the um, two essays that you had to read for today. So first, The Will to Believe by William James. Um, so the, the kind of orienting question of the will to believe is, is it permissible to believe something on insufficient evidence? Um, and uh, here he's directly responding to a, a philosopher named um, Clifford, who argues that it is uh, always impermissible to believe something on insufficient evidence. Um, now, uh, James specifically focuses this question in on a particular type of question. So, so you might ask about any kind of question, could you believe on insufficient evidence? But James is particularly focused on what he calls genuine options, right? That is, uh, where you have uh, a, a question of belief that is living, right? Um, that means that that you sort of, as a psych just a psychological matter, could could entertain either believing or disbelieving uh, a claim, right? It's forced, right? That means that there's no kind of way out of the question. Um, uh, there's no there's no it's it's a it's a true dichotomy. You have to believe or not believe. And it's, and it's momentous. It actually matters uh, now uh, whether, you, whether you believe or, or don't believe. So um, James focuses the scope of his argument on genuine options, where there's a, there's a, a genuine choice. Um, that you, it feels like a real choice to you. It's not already decided uh, by a matter of, of either evidence or, or prejudice, right, one way or the other. Um, and uh, in, in some sense, you, you have to make a choice. Sort of withholding judgment is, is in, in a, the case of a genuine option, sort of the same as, as uh, not believing, right? So it's forced in that way. Now, one of the key sort of starting points of James' argument, uh, or, or key elements of James' argument, is um, his uh, claim that there actually are two epistemic commandments, right? Two, um, two laws, 
uh, governing the ethics of our belief, right? Um, one is that we should believe the truth, and the other is that we should shun error. Right? And, and I think one of James's great innovations in this essay is to argue that actually these are not the same thing. These laws pull in different directions. They can conflict with one another. Um, if one has a really permissive notion of belief, right, then one is likely to capture more truths, um, but also to, cap to believe more errors, right? If one is very abstemious, really only believes things for which there is overwhelming evidence, uh, the likelihood of error is much lower, but also the likelihood that uh, of um, fa failing, the, the chance that you'll fail to believe a truth is also higher, right? So these things pull against each other. And so, you know, I think it's worth thinking about here, what is the real scope of James's argument, right? Does it only apply to religious belief? He spends a lot of time in the essay talking about religious belief. Um, he has other examples that obviously aren't religious belief in uh, focused, but um, is, uh, you, you have, I think it's, we should ask ourselves, what is he really, what is really the scope of his argument in the final analysis? Is it, is it really on religion or, or, or more practical matters as well? Now, um, uh, Cooper's, the gain from a belief, uh, also I think um, has significant pragmatist uh, element to it. Um, uh, although it's, it's perhaps not stated in uh, uh, the same kind of way that James states it. So, uh, for example, um, Cooper says, faith means treating the true as true, right? So what does it mean, faith means treating the truth as true? It sounds kind of, um, you know, circular, right? But I think what I think it's clear from context what uh, Cooper means here is uh, really acting on the belief, right? Not just entertaining it intellectually, but um, acting as if you believe it to be true, right? Um, uh, to, to connect with this, she also says, um, life must be something more than dilettante speculation. I think those two notions are connected. Life must be more, more than dilettante speculation. It must be something that um, uh, we act on, right? Uh, our intellectual life um, has to have meaning by virtue of its connection with our practice. Right? Um, and I think Cooper really disdains a kind of intellectualism that doesn't touch on, on action. And, and uh, obviously um, uh, she has in mind a kind of theoretical commitment to things like uh, equality or, or human rights, uh, to civil rights, without being willing to act on it. And that's the sort of thing that Cooper really has in mind, I think, in making these criticisms. So that's a taste of the, the two essays um, and sort of some of the background. Um, I look forward to talking with you about these um, uh, soon either uh, in class or on Discord uh, or in the comments here in the videos, uh, on the videos. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, we'll see you next time.